thing. Um, it's a little weird to, it feels a little weird to ask for donations for a political campaign right now because there are a lot of people struggling and a lot of organizations that need our help. But uh, when we can't knock on doors, uh, it becomes a lot more expensive to reach voters where they are. And uh, so your donations would be really appreciated right now. Um, we've got a lot of stuff in the works that we'd really like to get in front of voters' eyes. Um, also, you know, it's, it's important that we uh, try to cushion the blow from when we hit the ground um, from this pandemic uh, as much as possible. But it's also important that we figure out how to remake our society uh, positively once the dust settles from this. And I think having Mel in Congress will help us do that. So, um, you know, y'all if, if can either right now or at the end of this, at the end of this uh, presentation, if y'all can go to donate.melfordprogress.com, if you have anything to spare, we'd really, really appreciate it. Um, so if you've seen the documentary, Knock Down the House, you may remember this scene where uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez compares her campaign literature to Joe Crowley's campaign literature. And she's pointing out the, uh, that her literature uh, emphasizes a clear call to action, which is vote on Tuesday, Ju on Tuesday, June 26th. And why, when you flip over to the back, it talks about the key issues that are important to her. Whereas Joe Crowley's pamphlet is, um, it look, it, you know, it's shiny, it looks nice. She calls it a Victoria's Secret catalog, um, but it doesn't, provide voters with the information that they need. And this was my favorite scene in this movie, of course, because it was a scene that talked about design. Um, now what AOC was talking about was information hierarchy. And that's super important uh, in political design. But what we're going to be talking about tonight is not the hierarchy of your, of your design, but rather um, the letters themselves and how the shape of those letters can, and the typefaces that you're using can uh, influence the um, communication, um, can, 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 can affect the voice that you're communicating in. Um, so we're gonna rewind quite a bit um, to when I was first coming into political awareness uh, in middle school. Um, and the very first elections that I, that I remember were uh, you know, Gore, the Bush-Gore in 2000 and uh, Bush-Kerry in 04. And so if we look at the, um, if we look at the graphic languages that each of these are using, these kind of provide the context for what we're going to be talking about uh, as we talk about uh, how presidential campaigns use typography to influence their messaging. And the reason we're talking about presidential campaigns in particular is first of all, they're very visible. Um, but second of all, they, are, they necessarily use type uh, in prominent ways because so often the candidate's name is the most important piece, uh, the most important graphic identifier. Um, so if we look at the difference between these two, we kind of see like an established vernacular for Democrats uh, versus Republicans. On the left, we have the Democrats, they're using these bookish serifs, you know, they're the, the, sm the smart people who are going to, you know, be, uh, be policy wonks and give us health care. And on the right, we've got the Republicans who are, you know, bold and masculine and going to bring us to war. And then four years later, uh, keep us in war. Um, so with this in mind, um, by the way, if you, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to drop them in the Q and A. Um, uh, we have, I'll break for questions about halfway through and then again, uh, at the end. So, um, with this in mind, um, in 2008, uh, I was in college and, uh, I was a political science major and I was getting interested in graphic design. And so the Obama campaign was really kind of a touchstone for me, uh, in my, in my design education, because this was a, a political campaign that became known for its quality graphic design. So this was the logo that the Obama campaign launched with. Um, and so what we notice about this is that this is early in a campaign. This is when you, you know, you have this like handsome young senator who gave a great speech in 2004, but most people have never heard of him. He has about, um, he has single digit name recognition. Um, but the people who have heard of him are really enthusiastic about him. And at this point in the campaign, you need to get a whole bunch of young people to move to Iowa um, and, you know, pay, pay them very little and get them to knock on people's doors and uh, spread the good news about Barack Obama. So if we compare what's going on in, um, in, this, in this logo to what was going on uh, 
previously in the vernacular of democratic politics, we're still kind of appealing, speaking in the, de in the democratic uh, language, we're still using serif typefaces. Serifs, by the way, are those little feet that you see on letters. Sans serif means without serif. Uh, so, um, but it, this is kind of a different kind of serif. This is, you know, Obama's like the, 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 the new generation of Democrats, right? We've got this like thinner, crisper serif typeface. Uh, this, is, this is a typeface called, uh, called Joanna. Um, and so, and also, you know, the logo, it has this gradient effect, kind of looks like a hip web startup circa 2008. Um, and this was, this was a solid, uh, a solid identity to launch with, but the identity changed throughout the campaign as the, as who they needed to appeal to changed. So, um, fast forward to about, um, about October of, uh, of 2000, 2015, he's polling, you know, he, he's got, gotten the name recognition up. He's polling about dead even with Hillary Clinton. And um, so we need to start appealing to a, broad, to a broader base of people. And so what the Obama campaign does is they bring in a typeface called Gotham. Uh, and Gotham is a really uniquely American typeface. Uh, it's a typeface that was designed by, by an American. Someone asked for a simple definition of serif. Um, sure. So if we, if we go back, uh, uh, ser serifs are the little feet on the letters on the left. And, uh, if the letters on the right don't have serifs. So a serif typeface is something like times and a sans serif is a, uh, a typeface like Arial or, Hel or Helmetica. Uh, okay. So, uh, Gotham. Gotham is a really uniquely American typeface. It was designed by an American, Tobias Fur Jones, uh, based on the signage on top of the Port Authority bus terminal. And um, so this isn't like some pretentious European typeface, you know, designed by someone named Franz. I mean, it was designed by a guy named Tobias, um, but it's based on this blue collar uh, lettering that was made by metal workers um, when they, in, the, in, the mid, in the mid 20th century. And so um, Goth Gotham also has this sort of unique ability to, um, to to like it seems like it's speaking straightforwardly. The type designer Chris Sowersby uh, said about Gotham that Tobias Fair Jones has drawn letters so uh, letter forms so obvious that they're almost archetypical. Um, so let's compare uh, Gotham to another typeface that is really ubiquitous, uh, Helvetica. So Helvetica is kind of like your default sans serif typeface. You see it everywhere. If you live in New York City, you see it every day when you're traveling on the subway. And so if we compare the top to the bottom, there's sort of like an untrustworthiness with the, with the one on the bottom. Um, it's, it's maybe like not, not, uh, not at ease enough. It's a little, a little too rigid where you have like these, um, the ends of the letters are all cut at horizontal angles. Like it's, 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 it's kind of over rationalized. Whereas Gotham, kind of like sits in this space where, you know, everything's based on circles. It's a little more open. And I think that makes um, the message change we can believe in seem a little less hokey uh, or a little more believable. And let's compare it to a serif typeface. So an another serif typeface that you may be familiar with is Times um, or Times New Roman. And I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust this at all because uh, you know, ser serifs aren't going to bring change. Serifs are what, we, are, what we've, are what we've had for a really, for a really long time. Serifs are, serifs are traditional. Um, so, okay. So let's, but speaking of serifs, let's fast forward to, uh, to July of 2016. Obama's locked up the nomination. Now he needs people to start seeing him as President Barack Obama, like, like seeing themselves going into the voting booth and, and, and pulling the lever for him in November. Um, and so, now he needs to appeal a little bit more to tradition, a little bit more to, to, um, to authority, you know, cause he's, he's a young guy, you know, and he's, and he's running against John McCain, who's been, uh, in the Senate for, for forever. Um, so they, they went to a typeface called Requiem, which is based on, um, Renaissance lettering, uh, but they clipped the serifs, uh, really, really short. So default, the actual version of Requiem has much longer serifs, the feet, on the ends of the letters than, than, this, than this does, they clipped them off. So it still, feel, so it still feels kind of, kind of streamlined, a little sleek, um, kind of feels like it's inscribed uh, on the Resolute desk already. So 
you can see how the Obama campaign was changing, was changing their, uh, you know, changing their, their graphic identity to reflect the messaging that they, were, that, they were, that they were doing. Now, on the other side of the aisle, we got John McCain. And John McCain, um, John McCain was known as, by a certain M word, uh, and this, this is what I would ask my class to shout it out, but, um, but it, it's, uh, it's, anyway, it's Maverick. So he's, you know, he's the sort of Republican that Democrats could maybe think about voting for, uh, someone, who, someone who crosses the aisle. Um, so what's a Maverick typeface? Is it a, is it a serif typeface? Is it a sans serif typeface? Uh, no. It's a flared sans serif typeface. This is a typeface called Optima, kind of halfway between a sans, ser a sans serif and a serif. Um, now, there's another probably more significant reason that they chose the, this typeface for John McCain's identity, and that's because of the other thing that John McCain was known for, which was as a war hero in the, in, uh, uh, in the, in the Vietnam War. And uh, Optima is the typeface that's used on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So even if you don't know that, um, you're you probably have some subtle association in your mind that when you see that, when you see McCain's name in Optima, um, you know, it, it creates this sort of mnemonic association with, um, with, the Vietnam, with the Vietnam War. Okay, now let's fast forward to, uh, fast, fast forward to August. Um, you know, McCain's, what, eight points down? He needs a game change. He brings in Sarah Palin. He's got to he's got to he's got to appeal to the base. So he brings in this this right wing governor from Alaska, um, and uh, so what do you do when you're when you're using Optima, but you're trying to appeal back to the Republican base? Think back to what to, to, to these Bush and Cheney identities that, uh, from from 2000 to 2004. They were like these big, bold, sans serif typefaces. So what do you do when you have Optima and you need to appeal to the Republican base? You use Optima Extra Black. Um, now, okay, let's fast forward to 2012. So Obama's running for re-election. Uh, he's brought change. We have change. Ch change has happened. We, we, need, we need to keep the change. We need, we, need, we, need, we need change, but not too much of it because uh, we, we, we want to keep the guy around. Um, so how do you show change standing its ground? Uh, well, you put serifs on Gotham. Um, so this was, this was Obama's 2012 identity. Now, on the other side of the aisle, you have Mitt Romney. And I'm not really sure what you should do when your candidate's uh, biggest liability is that he's seen as an out of touch plutocrat, but I'm pretty sure you shouldn't use the typeface of Roman emperors. Uh, this is a typeface called Trajan, which is based on uh, Trajan's column in Rome, uh, one of, which is one of the most um, preserved, uh, preserved versions of Roman inscriptional capitals. There's another problem with this with this uh, word mark, which is something that people like to do. Uh, they like to try to turn the first initial into a logo, like something they can separate out. Which I don't think that this R is distinctive enough to work on its own anyway. Like if you saw this R standing in a like Twitter profile photo, I don't think you'd recognize it as Mitt Romney's R necessarily. But the other problem with this is that it isolates itself from the rest of the word, so it's really really easy to just do this. Um, which again, if you're if your candidate's biggest liability is that he's seen as an out of touch plutocrat, this is this isn't a great thing to do. Okay, so let's fast forward to 2016. Um, so we got Hillary Clinton. She's running with virtually universal name recognition. She doesn't have the same, uh, you know, the, the same issues that um, that uh, Barack Obama did in 2008. You know, she she's she's got to like kind of. She's trying. She's trying to. She's trying to be a big tent candidate. So um, they hired um, Michael Beirut from Pentagram to design a logo. He's designed logos for uh, Verizon, Mastercard, which you know, make of that what you will. Um, but he said, you know, he said that the goal with the logo was to create was to make something that was that was you know really universally recreatable, like something that a three year old could 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 draw, which they did. Like you see this, uh, you see this H logo. In um, in people's windows, drawn by three-year-olds, um, still, and so they so with so they started with the logo, and this logo is made of like really simple geometric forms, and so in order to find a typeface that um, that can accompany this logo, they went they went to a typeface. Uh, this is actually a typeface called Sharp Sands, uh, designed by Lucas Sharp, who is in um, who's in Brooklyn, um, but they 
they redesigned it slightly. They gave the eye, the eyes had square dots. They gave it round dots to make it a little friendlier uh, and renamed it Unity Bold. And the thing about having a, t a single typeface that can, um, that can uh, stand for, um, that can stand for the campaign is that you can just use it over and over and over again. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you use this typeface consistently, use it in consistent colors and use it in consistent ways, like you don't even have to put the logo on, on your, on your, uh, on your communication in order to, um, in order to get it to read as belonging to the campaign. Um, and you know, the, 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 it, it, it's, this, it, it, it's almost comical sometimes when you see like people bringing these homemade signs, uh, compared to these like really, really well-produced, uh, you know, branded, branded signs. Um, now on the other side of the aisle, we had Donald Trump. And uh, I think that the, 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 this is, this is just someone saying, we need something wide. We need something powerful. Uh, we need something big. And, you know, that may have been the man, it's the man himself or, um, but so, th so this is just your, your standard wide sans serif typeface spaced out to take up more space. Um, but you know, it's, it's on brand for the candidate. Um, I like though that, uh, you know, that you have two candidates whose names are exactly the same length, exactly the same number of letters, and you still can't get those five letters to align. Um, but I think that, you know, the most powerful piece of political design that we had in 2016 was the make America great again hat, which is really just a, um, you know, that that's, a serif typeface, probably times or century, um, whatever whatever the hat factory had, um, and so I think that uh, this is an object lesson in the in the fact that um, you know it, good design or effective design rather isn't about some aesthetic preference or about you know the uh, about you know appealing to. Swiss modernist values or whatever, but it's about um, telling telling a telling a true story or a story that resonates. And whether that story resonates with you with you or me is a is a different story is a different question. But it's definitely resonated with a whole bunch of people. Um, now, all right. So also in 2016, we had our boy Bernie, uh, and so Bernie Sanders had a pretty unique problem, which is he's got to he's got to sell democratic socialism to the American public, which is skeptical of, of socialism. And so, um, you know, you, you, you could, you could like, the, the designers of, the, of this, of this word mark tried to deliberately step away from sort of, from these like, uh, you know, so Soviet, um, like the, the traditional language of, of socialism. They tried to re kind of rebrand Bernie as, as like uh, the Americana candidate. Um, which I think they did pretty effectively. They're using a slab serif typeface. Slab serif meaning it has serifs, but the serifs are really, really thick. Um, so you know, it feels kind of like um, it feels vaguely Western, maybe. Um, it just feels kind of cl classic Americana. They also made the B in his uh, in in Bernie smaller, which uh, you know makes makes it a little bit more approachable. It's kind of like the you know gives him like a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more personal. Uh, I also I also read that they deliberately avoided making the star in his name red um, for the for the reasons I, I mentioned before, which is which is that they're trying to avoid excuse me avoid these um, you know the traditional uh, signifiers of socialism. Um, now you know Bernie in twenty in twenty sixteen didn't have um, that sophisticated of a typographic identity, but then um, in twenty twenty. Uh, he, uh, th his campaign started using this typeface Jubilat pretty consistently. And this is the same typeface that was used in his logo. Uh, it's just a bolder version of it. And so this is, you know, going back to Hillary's campaign in 2016, this is sort of the similar, same approach. If you, you, if you pick a typeface that's, that's speaking in the voice you want, you want to speak in and you use it consistently, then, um, you know, it, it, it then it, uh, speaks to your, uh, it speaks to your campaign's messaging really, really well. So uh, we're going to look at a few other of the uh, of the also rans from uh, this past Democratic primary. Um, I, I I'm not you know uh, not going to look at all of them. So I'm sorry. So uh, but just just ones that I think are typographically significant. So um, Elizabeth Warren. 
So Elizabeth Warren, uh, you know, she's, they're trying to, to push her as a, as a fighter, right? Like she's, she's the person, you know, she's, she's nevertheless, she persisted, right? She's going to be the, the, she's going to get up there and um, she's going to be loud and she's going to, um, she's going to fight for the, the things that matter for, matter to us. And so um, this typeface that they're using is actually a typeface called ringside, which is based on boxing posters. So, um, you know, you could, you could argue that that's a little bit literal, but I think, I think it's pretty effective. Um, and then in her word mark, uh, the W and the N are a little bit pointy, almost like they have teeth. Um, so I think they're trying to, um, you know, try, try, they were trying to uh, push her as this, uh, kind of, as this kind of like bold progressive fighter uh, with, with, with this graphic identity. And then, um, you know, the, and then later in the campaign, they introduced a serif typeface called Freight uh, for some of the like wordier, more policy oriented content. Um, and the, you know, I, I think that, you know, if you have a college professor running for president, you kind of need a serif typeface in your, in your, uh, in, 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 in your uh, quiver. Now, okay, so we also have Joe Biden. And so what do we notice about Joe Biden's uh, identity? It's like, it's pretty, it's pretty geometric, right? Like it's, it's got all, like that O is like almost a perfect circle, that D is almost a perfect circle, the E is really square, the N is really triangular, um, at, least in, at least in the words Joe and Biden. The, the, the rest of the typeface maybe isn't quite so much, but I think that this is kind of like trying to appeal to the, um, to, you know, Joe, Joe Biden's trying to run on his association with, um, with, with President Obama. And so I think that this is sort of like, if you take the typeface Gotham, which also has this sort of uh, geometric construction and like very circular construction, uh, and then you kind of like take it to the next step. Um, that's, what, that's what I imagine they were going for here. Um, however, they've doubled down on this typeface a little too strongly, I think, and especially using it in all caps. Um, but on the other hand, shouting, incoherently is maybe on brand for Joe Biden. So uh, yeah. Now also kind of like coasting on Obama's legacy was Julian Castro. Um, he was using a typeface called Mallory, which is also, which is pretty similar, also pretty similar to Gotham. It's a little bit more, um, a little bit more calligraphic, meaning it's a little bit more influenced by the human hand, you can see that in letters like E and J, how instead of uh, how it has these sort of angled N's and S. Um, and uh, this is a typeface called Mallory, which was actually designed by the, by the same designer as Gotham. This was um, designed several years later. Uh, and, and also, you know, he's, uh, he's uh, highlighting the accent in his name too, because he's, uh, he was, uh, you know, one of the, what, was he the first Latino, Latino candidate for, for president? I don't know if he was if he was the first, but he but he he was certainly running on on uh, on um, his Latino heritage and his uh, and his immigration bona fides. Okay, so then we move on to Pete Buttigieg. Uh, now, Mayor Pete, he's got kind of the same issue that uh, Obama had in um, two thousand eight, where doesn't have a ton of written name recognition. Like he's got, he's got a peer legit out the gate. And so uh, he hired a very good um, branding agency in Brooklyn called HyperAct to work on his identity. And so, you know, the, so what we see about this is it, it kind of reminds you of say a, um, blue jeans or a steel worker. Like this is, this is based on the, on a bridge in South Bend. Um, so, you know, he's, he's like, trying to run as this industrial, uh, industrial Midwest mayor. So his identity reflects that. Um, they also kind of like, did, this is, um, they did this thing where they, 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 they really tried to create this sense of, of team, like team Pete. And so they created these almost like sports team logos for each of the states, which, um, you know, is, is maybe, maybe overkill. Um, and I, I don't know how effect you know how effective they are at, uh, but I'm sure I'm sure people I'm sure people bought shirts and bought signs. So, um, so yeah, go go team Pete, I guess. 
Um, and then we got Kamala Harris. So uh, th this identity was based on um, was based on uh, when she was a, uh, a pro when she was um, a uh, prosecutor in California. She would always uh, enter the courtroom, and say Kamala Harris for the people. Um, and so, but the uh, designers of this of this identity specifically said that they were trying to evoke uh, Shirley Chisholm's uh, campaign. Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman to run for president in 1972, and um, personally, her uh, her campaign identity reminds me more of Late Night with Jimmy Fallon um, because it's the same typeface. This is a typeface called Bureau Grotesque, or maybe uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Um, I think her I think her identity was most effective when they uh, they kind of broke up her first name. Um, kind of feels like someone chanting like Kamala. Um, all right, so that's the uh, presidential identities portion of this presentation. Um, I'm gonna move into the second portion, which is where I'm gonna talk about um, the uh, development of the Melford Progress identity. But um, so let's just, I don't, does anyone have any questions? I saw that uh, uh, I have a question from my grandma, which is, was width of letter McCain intended to indicate stability? Um, okay, so let's go back to McCain. I don't know. I mean, I think that the, like the width of the letter, I guess the N in particular is fairly wide, but the M, like, like the, 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 propor the proportions of, of Optima are based on um, inscriptional Roman capitals. If you look at Romney's logo, um, it, it has that same sort of like wide set N um, and that, that, that's the typeface Trajan, which is Trajan's column um, in, in, in ancient Rome. So uh, I don't know that the width was necessarily intended to indicate stability, but these Roman inscriptional capitals, like they, they were literally inscribed in stone for a reason. And so I think that like there's a certain proportion of letters that we're comfortable seeing and which feel kind of institutional. And so if you're sticking to those, um, to those Roman capitals um, or, or, or the proportions of those Roman capitals, things are going to feel a little, a little bit stable. I think, that, I think that Gotham does that too. Um, I mean, the proportions aren't, classically proportioned, but like it's, you know, they're pretty wide set. They feel, they feel pretty sturdy. Um, any comment on color selection? Adam Williams asked. Uh, for me, the Warren color selection was uh, particularly refreshing from the standard red, white, and blue, relying on the mint green and indigo. Honestly, color's not really my, um, my area of expertise, um, but I mean, color, color certainly plays a role, and it's something we thought about when we were when we were working on Mel's campaign, which I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, um, you know, I think there are certain like you've got you've got red for Republican and blue for and blue for Democrats, but I, but if you look at the actual campaign identities, I don't think they do that that much. Um, you know, I, I think I think um, Warren was trying to stake out. This is actually something you saw a lot in the Democrats. This this uh, this go around was like them trying to stake out a particular color palette. So like Warren had uh, what they called Liberty Green. So it was supposed to be the Statue of Liberty, and then this like really deep uh, navy blue. Um, and then you know you've got uh, Pete Buttigieg doing these sort of like um, more like sports team colors, and then you've got Kamala Harris. Well, she's got the purple and orange, but like then she kind of went to a more primary color palette. So I don't, I don't know necessarily. Like I'm, I'm not an expert on color psychology, but, um, but I do think that there's, uh, there's effectiveness in uh, staking territory for yourself. Um, although you know all these, all these people lost. So I think that maybe speaks to the fact that graphic design isn't the most important thing in. A pre in a campaign. Um, is shading of color an effective tool? I think that's pro probably addressed that in the previous question. So how would a campaign decide between choosing an existing typeface or creating your own typeface? Shelby Highpole asks. Does it mean something to create your own? Like BDE. All right. Um, well, we did create a typeface for uh, for uh, Mel's campaign, 
Um, I don't know how much BDE was was a factor, but I uh, I think I think it was. Well, I'll I'll talk about why we why we decided why we decided to do that. I think that it's a lot of work to make a type to make a font. Like speaking from personal experience, like most of the time, that's not something you want to do. And if you have and if you have something that's effect that's effective, um, then you should just use that. Um, go back to the 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 Hillary campaign. Like the, this typeface um, Unity was the typeface for the campaign, but it was it, it wasn't designed from the ground up for the campaign. Uh, it was based on the typeface, uh, the typeface Sharp Sands with like some minor modifications made to it. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I think that designing a typeface takes a really long time and probably isn't the best route to take. Um, but I can talk about why, why we chose to do it for, for Mel's campaign. Okay, uh, Joseph Labadia asks, how does one quantify or gain insight into the effectiveness of a brand or graphic of type other than if the candidate won? That's a really good question and one I have no clue how to answer. Um, there are probably much smarter people than I who, who are working that out, um, working that out, but I, 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 don't, I don't really know if it's quantifiable. Um, I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> Um, Chanel Gallant asks, can you say more about the role that race plays in presidential typography other than Julian? Uh, well, I mean, I think that Kamala, you know, Kamala's appeal to Shirley Chisholm is a, is a good example of that. Um, whether, whether it was an effective appeal, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, but, uh, I think that's about all I, all I have to say about that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to dig myself into a hole talking about stuff that I don't know about. Uh, Chanel also asked, can you suggest some other entry level 101 introductions to the psychology of typography? Um, I can recommend a really good book. Uh, it's called Just My Type by Simon Garfield. Uh, yeah, yeah, Just My Type by Simon Garfield. Um, it's kind of like a pop Psycholo pop psychology book about typography. Um, much like this presentation, it's not scholarly. Uh, it's more a work of fabulism, um, but it's a really great introduction into the effect that uh, typefaces have on perception. Um, anonymous attendee, thoughts on the arrow symbolism in Hillary's logo? Um, I don't know. It's pointing forward. I think the thing about Hillary's logo is that um, the thing about logos in general is that they're a, they're like a logo can't say everything that's go that you want to say about about your brand or your candidate or um, or the, your product. Um, what it really is is it's a bucket into which people can throw their associations. And the thing about Hillary's logo is it's so simple that it's a really big bucket. And people have a lot of associations, uh, had a lot of associations with her going into that campaign. And so like, if you're a fan of Hillary, then you think that that logo symbolizes, um, symbolizes forward movement and it's like a symbol we can rally behind. And if you're not a fan of her, you think, uh, depending on the reason you're not a fan of her, you think that it's, you know, maybe cold and corporate, you know, it was designed by the guy who designed the MasterCard and Verizon logos. Um, or you know, or or you know, you're you're you think that like she's too too far right, and like the the arrow's pointing right. Why would you do that if you're a Democrat? So I think that there's any number of um, of ways that you can interpret it. Like a, a logo, a logo is not saying something explicitly. It's really giving you a um, giving you a bucket into which you can throw your associations. Um, all right, Zach. Cassidy asks, in designing campaign material for non-national campaigns, can you design around the character of the area you, the, your candidate is running for? Um, I think so. I don't know how much that played a factor in um, the identity we did for Mel, but sure, I don't see why not. Um, all right, and uh, okay, so let's, let's move on to part two of, the, uh, of this presentation. So I'm actually going to share with you the actual the presentation that I gave uh, Mel and Alita in their um, in their living room when uh, back way back in July of 2019. So almost you know almost almost a year ago. Uh, this was when this this campaign was just an idea. Uh, 
And um, so, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll take you through. So the first thing that I do when, um, when, I, when I'm creating an identity for someone is I just write a, a brief statement about, uh, after, after, well, the first thing I do is have a lengthy conversation with them about what they're trying to get, what they want to say about themselves, like what their unique positioning is. Um, and so, you know, when I was talking to Mel and Alita, I was, we were, I was, you know, asked about his policy positions, asked how he, you know, what distinguishes him from Grace Meng, the incumbent. Um, and so I just write out a short, um, a, a really brief statement. And like, you, you want this to be brief because uh, you want to be able to distill down what you want to say into as simple an idea as possible. If you're, if you're trying to say too many things at once, it's just, it's not, it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna read. So this was the statement that I wrote, which was Melchiades Gagarin is a lifelong community advocate who is running for Congress in New York's sixth congressional district to be the bold progressive fighter unbeholden to the political establishment that this moment calls for. So um, as we just established, uh, the typeface Gotham was really effective in, uh, in Barack Obama's presidential campaign. So effective that it's kind of become, it's taken hold of the imagination of uh, of Democrats. This is from the um, Center, Center for uh, American Politics and Design. This is a collection of sans serif Democratic candidates logos and I've circled all of the logos that are in Gotham. Uh, so that, you know, lot, lots and lots of Democrats, you, they love to use the typeface Gotham. Um, in fact, uh, Grace Meng uses Gotham in her, uh, in, in her uh, campaign identity. And so, uh, you know, we could just set Mel's name in Gotham and call it a day, but I think we need to talk about the story that we're trying to tell. And so, um, if we're trying to highlight that Mel's a community advocate, what's like, so let's see what, how we can take Gotham and make it more community oriented. So I thought about community and the, and what I thought about was, um, these kind of hand painted grocery store signs. Um, and you sometimes see these in Queens, like you don't, you don't see these as much anymore. Um, but actually, I mean, the grocery store next to, uh, next to Mel and Alita's apartment has, um, has uh, some, not, not, not beautiful hand-painted signs like these necessarily, but they're, but they're drawn with a chisel marker, uh, like the ones in the lower right. Um, so what if we take the proportions of Gotham, like this, this really sturdy, um, you know, this really sturdy, really earnest typeface, and we kind of like, what if we painted it with a, with, with, with a flat brush like those grocery store signs? So that's what that would look like. Um, and so we said it in, here's, here's, his, uh, here's the whole first name, here's uh, just, just Mel. Um, just trying it a few different ways to see what, see what it feels like. Um, you know, we weren't really sure whether we were gonna go with Melchiatas or Mel at this point. So we're gonna try it all possible ways. So, uh, okay, so that's direction number one. Direction number two unbeholden to the political establishment. So if, if Mel's outside the political establishment, what does an outsider political identity look like? And so I thought about, okay, well, one thing you don't see a lot in political identities is script. So I thought, okay, well, let's try to design a script that feels um, inspiring, but also feels, you know, it feels masculine. Um, so, something that we can rally behind. Um, I, I actually, uh, Ilhan Omar used a script in her, in her logo um, in 2018, but I couldn't find any other examples of script in political identities. Um, so this is, this, 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 is what I, this is what I drew. Um, what I liked about this one was kind of like the flexibility of um, being able to put things around the script. Um, like, uh, so here it is as Melchiatis, here it is as Mel. Um, What's kind of fun about this is it parses out Mel for Progress, which was the URL that they had already registered at that point. So that's direction number two. And then uh, direction number three, bold progressive fighter. So kind of, you know, thinking back to the, the, what I was saying about the Warren campaign a little bit. Um, the way I, that, I, that I chose to represent a, a bold progressive fighter was I wanted to have, um, I wanted to have uh, letters that had sharp corners on them. And so I looked at like chisel marker typography, like the, 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 if, you're, if you're using a chisel Sharpie to create uh, letters, um, what, uh, you know, that's what those letters look like. So, um, so this is what I came up with. And uh, 
Here it is as Melchiades, here it is as Mel. And so those are the three directions. And so at this point, this is maybe my favorite thing that's ever happened in a client presentation. Um, Mel calls his daughter Zoe over to the table and asks Zoe, which one do you like? And uh, she said, I like the third one. And I asked why? And she said, because it looks like graffiti, but you can still read it, which is maybe the best piece of feedback I've ever gotten in a pitch presentation. Um, and so we, 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 went back and we went back and forth on these for a while, talking about the, the positives and negatives about each of them. Um, but eventually settled on the third direction. We thought that that was like the, the most, the most, um, the most interesting and the most exciting, um, and the, and, uh, the most different from things we had seen before. Um, so, uh, this was where we wound up. And what I really like about this, about this logo is, um, uh, is it kind of feels like a shield too, not just, not just that it has sharp corners, um, so it, it, you know, there are a few different associations you could have with this. It's like it's a shield that he's protected. He's protecting the working class with. It's got these sharp corners that were, um, you know, we're, we're attacking the um, that we're attacking the uh, entrenched power structures with, or it's it's like chisel mark, you know, chisel marker protest signs. Um, so hopefully, like when you look at this logo, you get you have one of those associations, or you just think it looks real cool. Um, for for. You know, what's really important when you're creating something like this is uh, you can't use this typeface everywhere in the, in the campaign the way that uh, the Hillary campaign used Unity everywhere because this is a really, really distinctive typeface. So um, if you use it too much, it, for one thing, it takes away from the specialness of the logo, um, but, it also, uh, but it also just like gets really, really heavy real quick. Um, so I, we need to find an accompanying typeface. Um, so this is the typeface Azo Sans. Uh, it's kind of geometric, but also kind of calligraphic. It's got these like, uh, like if you look at the ends of the letters, like this G in particular, it's got the same sort of like snap at the end of the letter that the that that this G has. It's also got like the same sort of angled um, angled stroke structure on that G. Um, so those are the things that I that I saw in Azo that I thought would be a good um, a good complement to the logo. But then, um, you know, this logo, this logo was really interesting. And I, and so we thought like, what the heck, well, let's just, let's just make a, let's make a typeface out of it. Just, just see what, ha you know, see what happens. We can use this typeface for a bunch of stuff. So um, I made this typeface, which I'm calling Chisel Bowl uh, after Shirley, but also because it's based on chisel marker, typo chisel marker lettering. Uh, so I think that's a good name for it. Um, and what we can what we can do with this typeface is we can use it in places where we really want to uh, speak to the campaign, like associate things with the campaign without um, without having the you know slapping Mel's face or slapping the logo on it. So it's really great for these policy positions, uh, and it's also great when we have uh, thing when we have uh, you know standalone pieces of identity like a donate link. So once again. Um, uh, if if you if you have anything to spare, we'd really appreciate uh, we'd really appreciate your um, your donations. Like I said, it's when you can't knock on doors, it, it costs a lot more money to reach voters. Um, I know there are a lot of organizations and a lot of people that need help right now. But uh, like I said, we also need to think about how we're going to rebuild our society after this after the dust settles on this. And I really think that having Mel in Congress uh, will help us do that. Um, so thank you very much. And if you have any questions. Um, I'm happy to stick around and, uh, and answer them. So let's, let's look at this Q&A and see what we have. So, um, um, I, oh, there are a few things in the chat. Okay, let's see what we got. Um, okay, Brian asks, do you think campaigns are over-reliant on familiar fonts or could a custom font ever be more appropriate? Is recognition too important? Okay, so the first part of that question, do I think campaigns are over-reliant on familiar fonts? I don't think so. Um, I mean, if you, look at the, if you look at the Democratic candidates in the, in the primary, like most of them were using um, typefaces that aren't immediately available to us, um, to, to most of us, like the, you know, typefaces that aren't bundled on our, on our computers or bundled with, our, with, our, with, with Microsoft Word. Um, and part of that is also that really great typefaces are more accessible to people than ever before. 
Um, you know, Google Fonts is uh, has a bunch of great and not so great fonts available for free. Um, if you're an Adobe user, Adobe has um, has a whole bunch of fonts that are available to for people for users of their software to use, um, which operates on a streaming model, kind of like Spotify, where the type designer gets a little bit of a cut every time someone uses it. Um, oh. Someone asked, will the recording of the Zoom be made available? And I think I, I think I realized I forgot to hit record on this thing. Well, shoot. Um, so no, it won't be made available. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Or no, Karina says it'll go up on YouTube in a few days, maybe. I don't know. Uh, okay, uh, is, could a custom font ever be more appropriate? Sometimes, I, I think it's a lot of work to make a custom font. That, 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 that's probably the reason most people don't do it. And, and frankly, um, this custom font that we're using on Mel's campaign is still a work in progress. Like the, the only reason that we're able to use it is because um, we have very few people designing things for the campaign. Um, if, you, if, it's a if, you, if you have a larger campaign, um, you, need, you need software, you need tools that work all the time. And um, you know, this typeface, I, I designed a question mark for this typeface specifically because uh, we needed a question mark the other day. Not, not for this slide that says questions, but for uh, uh, Mel and our, and our comms director, Karina, are doing a, um, doing a news series called What Now? Uh, so I designed a question mark specifically for that like two days ago. Um, right now, the only numbers that we have in this typeface are um, two, three, one, and nine. Two, three, because of June 23rd, which is when the, um, which is when the primary is, and one and nine because of COVID-19. Uh, also a zero. I decided, I forget why I designed a zero. So um, yeah, so I don't know that a custom font is necessarily a viable choice for a, for a non grassroots, non DIY campaign. Um, okay. Alita asks, hey, Eric, do you have a website where we could see more of your work? Yes, I do. It's at ericdoctor.com. Okay. Uh, Miriam Benzman says, um, referring back to Shirley Chisholm campaign of 1972 assumes people actually remember that far back if they were alive. That's absolutely true. Um, I mean, I think that like, even if, I think that's the, that's the, that's like the danger of having, um, things that, that are meant to have specific associations. If, if it means something to you, it's not necessarily going to mean that to someone else. So um, I think it's fine to use those as points of reference, um, but you need to understand, or, or, or inspiration, but I think you need to understand that how you perceive something isn't necessarily how someone else is going to perceive something. Uh, okay, my grandma asks, uh, when you design a logo for a candidate, do you try several and do a mini survey of reactions to each? Well, yeah, we did, well, we did three different, uh, you know, I did three different directions for, for this campaign. Um, the mini survey was really just, I, you know, it was really just Mel, Alita, and their kids. Um, I think that um, focus grouping too early can be dangerous um, because uh, you kind of need something. It's kind, it's kind of like you have a you have a little you have a sapling that you're trying to grow into a tree, and if you expose the elements too early, it can it can uh, it can kill the tree. Um, I know designers who don't do multiple multiple versions. Um, they do. They'll, they're like you know. They're, they're like I'm going to present one true solution, and you can take this solution or leave it. That's not me. I like doing multiple multiple versions, kind of multiple half baked versions, and engaging in dialogue with my clients and kind of and to, to, because I feel like that helps us refine the conversation. Like I don't I don't think I'm going to learn everything I need to learn in the first conversation I have with them or in the subsequent research that I'm doing while I'm working on an identity. So, um, you know, having a few things to look at and talk about helps us refine the messaging that we, that we, that we want to have. Um, okay. Logan asks, how did you decide between Mel and Melchiades? Uh, well, Melchiades is what's on the ballot. So, um, so that, that, that's what it came down to was, uh, we didn't want to. We didn't want to confuse people when they walked into the, into the ballot, and when they, when they walked into the voting booth and saw uh, Melchiades, and they're, and they're like, who, "Who who the heck is that guy?" Um, 
Am I a full-time designer for the campaign? If so, is that a common role nowadays at the congressional level? I'm not. I'm not a full-time designer for the campaign. I, I, ha I have. I have. I, I have a day job. I also teach. Uh, this is something I do um, nights and weekends. Um, and I don't. I don't know how common. Um, how common a role it is at the congressional level. I can. I can really only speak to this campaign. But I. But I doubt it is. Um, did you get pushback from the candidate from proposing a script since it's not typical, or did you all agree on the direction early on? Um, no, I mean Mel was actually, I actually the the um, I think the script was actually was actually the direction Mel was favoring, but um, Alita and Zoe and I all liked the third direction more, and uh, we we, we kind of thought the script felt felt a little too much like a like a like a bougie restaurant, um, which based on. Uh, which, which wasn't the best positioning for, for this campaign. Um, follow up, how many version, Adam also asks, uh, follow up, how many versions or meetings did you go through to get the final look? Um, well, we only had the, I mean, in this case, we like once we had the direction, we had the direction, um, but then after that, we had a few rounds of color explorations um, so like the, the actual, the actual word mark was settled pretty quickly. Um, I mean, I, I, I was refining it, um, through, through each of those, each of those rounds of color explorations. Um, but it, it, it took maybe like two, two, like maybe I think three rounds of color explorations for us to figure out that we wanted this like paper color background with, with color accents. Oh, I said I was going to talk a little bit about color choices. Um, when we were when we were working uh, when we got to the Mel part, so um, oh shoot, uh, so if we go back to like um, the reason we chose this blue in particular was uh, we well we actually looked at purple um, because a lot of the um, progressive candidates in um, in Queens in particular have been using purple to like Tiffany Caban and AOC, um, but. I, there was just something about the purple that didn't 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 feel right. I don't know. I don't know if it's um, I don't know if it's because Mel's a guy or or not or or what it was. But we we felt we felt really good about this blue, and the reason we chose this blue was because um, it was kind of like this democratic establishment navy like more navy blue, and we thought like okay, well if we take what like we're running to the left of them, so let's take that and make it more blue. Um, so that, 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 that's, where, that's where we wound up. Um, so Zach Cassidy asks, do you see any reason to change the font for the general election when Mel wins the primary? Um, probably not. Um, I, I mean, we're not, we're not thinking that far ahead. We're, 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 we're looking towards June 23rd and hopefully June 23rd. I, I mean, I, who, who, who knows what's going to happen at this point. Um, but you know, we're, we're, we're taking, we're taking this campaign one week at a time. And like, and, and honestly, like our, 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 our graphic language has evolved in pretty, in subtle ways since the beginning of, since the beginning of the campaign. Like that, that's, that's one of the things about working on a, a long campaign rather than just like handing a logo off to someone and saying like, here you go. The logo, the logo hasn't changed, but like, um, but you know we're doing we've been doing more um, you, you, I, like you, just 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 things like using using more all caps um, for certain things using color differently um, you, you know doing doing more more like kind of lockups like this uh, like uh, like on this poster um, trying to create little jewels like this 100% Queens thing. So that, that, that those are like little, just little subtle things that change through, through the campaign. I don't know that it's necessarily changing with our messaging or just like we've been working on this for months and you got to change things up a little bit to, you know, stay interested. So uh, Judy Doctor, Grandma, asks, do you ever make a minor change in the logo to relate to the t specific topic of a position paper? Um, you know, we talked about that at the beginning of the campaign. Like we talked about um, using red when we talked about Medicare for all or green when we talked about a green new deal. Um, the only time I can think of where we changed the color of the logo was um, for the St. 
uh, St. Pat's for All parade. Uh, we made a creed. But um, I mean, I, I, I've done a variation. I think, I think more than like changing the logo, like the fact that we have a font that's based on the logo means that we can make, um, means that we can make little badges that like this Medicare for All thing that uh, are so, that feel like the campaign logo. Um, so like, you know, we, uh, you know, you can, you can, you can do things like say abolish ice in this typeface and it, and, and this is now Mel saying abolish ice. Um, so, so, th so that, that's, that's kind of more the approach that we're taking rather than making minor changes to the logo. Um, anonymous attendee asks, can you talk more about AOC's design choices? I think she used yellow and other unusual choices. Yeah. I mean, I think AOC's, um, AOC's campaign identity was great. Um, and you can, you, and you know that because like, you can see a lot of the choices that she made or that her campaign made, uh, trickling down to other, um, to other campaigns, uh, that in, in this cycle, um, I mean, she was, she definitely wasn't the first candidate to use this like upward slanting type, upward slanting type, but, um, I mean, we're using upward slanting type. I don't know that we're using it because of her necessarily, but that like that, you know, that, that conveys hope. The designers of her, of her, uh, of her campaign said that they were basing it on Luchadora posters. Um, so that's why you have this like bold type behind her head, um, like at an angle. Um, I think my, my, um, my art director at my day job lives in Jackson Heights. And she said she, like the first time she heard, she heard of AOC was like walking through her neighborhood and she saw a poster and she's like, whoa, that's a cool looking poster. Um, and so that's, that's what we hope happens with Mel's posters. Um, when you're going to the grocery store and you see, and you see, and you're like, well, that looks different from most local posters. Um, but yeah, like she, she, she definitely used, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know why they use yellow necessarily. Um, I think, I think yellow, you know, yellow complements, complements purple. And so purple was the primary campaign color. So, um, probably just finding a palette that worked. We, 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 we at one point played with a yellow and purple, uh, color palette, but it, it just, it didn't stick. We, 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 what we, when we landed on this color palette where we have like kind of a paper, off white paper colored background with like color accents, that's what felt, felt right. It felt like, um, it felt like protest posters and, um, you know, it felt like it was more urgent, um, than, than, than bright colors. And it, and it's pretty cool. Cause if you like put this, put our posters up next to a whole bunch of brightly colored posters, like our posters are the first one you see, um, because they're the only one that's not a bright color. Um, that, does anyone else have any other questions? Um, I don't think so. So, uh, thank you all again for, uh, I'm going to stop my share. Here you go. All right. Thank you all again for coming out. Um, really appreciate uh, y'all, you know, spending some time learning about, oh, okay. We do have, we do have another question. <laughs> um, Zach says, this may not be your expertise, but I have noticed a lot of the images of Mel on the website, posters, et cetera, are less formal than what I have noticed from other candidates. And was that on purpose? Um, yeah, that wasn't that, that, that I, you know, we, um, Mel's a punk rocker. We like putting him in a leather jacket. I mean, he wears a leather jacket all the time. It wasn't so much. We put him in a leather jacket as he, as he has a leather jacket and that's what, and that's what he was photographed in. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, Karina could probably answer that better than I could. So, um, Anyway, thank, thank, thank you all again for coming out. Uh, really appreciate you all nerding out with me tonight. Um, if you have, you know, if, if you have any, any questions after this, like you, you can email design at melforprogress.com. Uh, that's me. And uh, yeah, thank, th th thanks for coming out. Have a good night, everyone. Oh, Karina, Karina wants to add the informal look felt most genuine for Mel. She said, she said what I was trying to say much better than I could. Okay. Have a good night, everyone.